And as we prepare to jump into the book of Luke again, I wanted to just share about something I love. Um, as I, I find medicine generally, not like the taking of drugs, but the, um, the practice of, me- of medicine kind of fascinating. And I think it's just amazing what medicine and doctors and nurses and surgeons and all of that can do to, to, to heal people. And I just find it all riveting. Um, there's kind of a joke in my family that when that I often go into doctor mode and when someone gets sick and, and things like that. But one of the things I love seeing is people that have like a debilitating disease or a debilitating um, problem be able to be like some sort of restored to good health. So like one example of this would be uh, this guy here, I'm blanking on his name, I think it's Michael. Michael has run the Boston Marathon with two prosthetic limbs, I think multiple years now. It's just amazing. A guy who wouldn't, wouldn't normally be able to walk can run a marathon um, by the use of modern medicine. I can remember being in a village in remote Peru with, a, with an eye doctor with us and him having like suitcases full of different levels of prescription glasses and people with really, really bad vision um, coming into the little medical clinic that we had set up there in Alao, Peru, and, and people trying on glasses after not being able to really see well at all and just their faces as they could now see the smiles on others' faces with clarity or read um, for the first time in a long time. Then perhaps one of the most fascinating and moving um, things that I've seen is a baby who was born deaf had a surgical procedure that allowed her hearing to be restored. And they filmed whenever she came through surgery and she had the drugs wore off, you know, the sedation and all of that stuff. And her mom and dad picked her up and they said her name. And her face went from like blank stare to just big eyed. And it's like her whole world changed. It's amazing. And so today, as we jump into our text, I want to check in on our own hearing, how we're hearing. And we're going to look at a story that Jesus tells in the process. And we're going to see that right hearing leads to right living. Simply put, when we hear correctly, we live in light of what we've heard. So with that, would you turn in your copy of God's Word to Luke chapter 8? We'll be in verses 4 through 21 together. Luke 8, 4 through 21. This is what God's Word says. As a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from every town, he said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, Some seed fell along the path, it was trampled on, and the birds of the sky devoured it. Other seed fell on the rock. When it grew up, it withered away, since it lacked moisture. Other seed fell among thorns. The thorns grew up with it and choked it. Still other seed fell on good ground. When it grew up, it produced fruit, a hundred times what was sown. As he said this, he called out, Let anyone who has ears to hear, listen. Then his disciples asked him, what does this parable mean? So Jesus said, the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given for you to know, but to the rest it is in parables, so that looking they may not see and hearing they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. The seed along the path are those who have heard, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. And the seed on the rock are those When they hear, receive the word with joy. Having no root, these believe for a while and fall away in a time of testing. As for the seed that fell among the thorns, these are the ones who, when they have heard, go on their way and are choked with worries, riches, and pleasures of life and produce no mature fruit. But the seed in the good ground, these are the ones who, having heard the word with an honest and good heart, hold on to it, and by enduring, produce fruit. 
No one after lighting a lamp covers it with a basket or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a lampstand so that all who come in may see its light. For nothing is concealed that won't be revealed and nothing hidden that won't be made known and brought to light. Therefore, take care how you listen for whoever has more will be given to him and whoever does not have even what he thinks he has will be taken away from him. Then his mother and brothers came to him, but they could not meet with him because of the crowd. He was told, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. But he replied to them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear and do the word of God. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, as I pray so often, I pray yet again this morning that you would send your light and your truth into our hearts this morning by your spirit and would they lead us? Would they lead us to Jesus? Would they lead us into life? We pray in Christ's name, amen. Before we jump into the text today, I thought it would be helpful to do a little bit of review and ask, what is a parable? What is a parable? Because we've, we've seen parables before in our uh, study of Luke so far. There have been several, and they've mostly been, been shorter parables, not very long, quick, quick parables that Jesus applies to specific situations. Um, and I think that this parable is the first lengthy parable that we'll come to in Luke, and we'll come to many more, so it would be well to do a little bit of review, because parables are... <laughs> Jesus's, some of Jesus' favorite ways to communicate with people. Parables, it's often said, are the, one of the highest forms of speech. There's sometimes allegories, sometimes metaphors, sometimes similitudes for you English people out there. And if you don't know what any of that means, don't worry about it. Uh, they're sometimes very brief. They're sometimes really long. Sometimes the parable has a one-to-one correspondence with something that's happening in our life. Sometimes they don't. The common phrase that you may have heard if you've been in church for a while is that parables are an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That's often thrown around, and that's a pretty good definition, except parables aren't just for heavenly life. They're, they're meant for really practical, day-to-day, earthly life as well. The simple definition, and one that we've used before that I'll pull up from a professor a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Pennington, He says that a parable in its broadest sense is an expanded analogy that God, that uses the God-given gift of imagination to reflect a real reality. It's an expanded analogy that causes us to use our imaginations to kind of picture, and we'll do that with this parable too, um, a real spiritual truth. Wants to use our creativity to, to tap into something deeper that the parable is saying. So with that in mind, let's begin jumping into our text. Jesus is surrounded by crowds of people. We had just heard in our text that if you look at verses one through three of chapter eight, that Jesus is is going out. He's got all sorts of people with him. There are crowds surrounding him. The 12 uh, disciples, the 12 apostles are with him, as are some women that Jesus honors in verses one through three, women that have come to follow Jesus, that Jesus brought to, to life, and they're actually big supporters of the ministry and mission of Jesus in the apostle. And it's kind of an impressive, impressive, not oppressive, impressive sight as the crowd is gathered around. Have you ever been to a concert where there's just so much energy built up, um, where people are just so eager to hear the band play or whatever, you can imagine that this is the kind of energy that's bubbled up in the room as people are waiting to hear Jesus speak. And Jesus speaks about the good news of the kingdom of God, we read in verse one. And so with with these crowds all around, with this bustle and this noise and this energy, Jesus begins to tell a story about a sower in a field throwing seeds. Any gardeners in here this morning? It's springtime, right? This is when we're, I think this is, I don't know anything about gardening, but this is when I think you plant seeds. Uh, Well, this is a culture that is agrarian. They know a lot about planting seeds. They're immediately connecting with this story. Okay, they're, they're imagining a guy throwing seeds. 
So I want you to connect this a little bit in your minds. Jesus is talking about the good news of the kingdom of God, and all of a sudden he's talking about a farmer throwing seeds, and Jesus makes some observations. Some of those seeds fall in hard places, and they never grow into anything. Some of those seeds fall on rocky ground. Some of those seeds fall on thorny ground. Some of those seeds fall on good soil. It's like the best thing I can explain is like, you know when you want to like plant a new grass seed and you get out your Scott's like seed thrower thingy and you pour the bag of, of seed into it and you and that thing spins as seeds are just kind of thrown everywhere and you watch some seed fall exactly where you want it to fall and other seeds fall in random places. Some fall on your walkway up to your front door. They're not gonna grow to anything. This is kind of what Jesus is saying. Hey, guy takes some seeds and he just starts throwing it liberally all over the place. Some fall in good places, some fall on bad. And Jesus says that this is what the kingdom of God is like. And then he closes with, he who has ears to hear, listen. And if you're in the crowd thinking, I don't really know what any of this means, you wouldn't be alone because the disciples have the same question. And that brings us to our next point, a story explained. The disciples flat out ask in the text, what does this mean? I love that because there's something really human. Jesus is talking. They're like, I don't know what the heck he's talking about. Let's just ask him. And so what does this mean? And now we begin to get into the why of parables. And Jesus uses a couple confusing statements, but as we'll see in his response, that parables, this way of speaking, are for revealing and therefore concealing. Parables are for revealing and therefore concealing concealing. He says in verse 10, if you have your Bible open, the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given for you to know, but to the rest it is in parables, so that looking they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Revealing and concealing. Looking they may not see and hearing they may not understand. For disciples and for followers of Jesus, those who believe in him and what he says, parables reveal mysteries. They reveal truths about the kingdom of God. They crack open the door, as it were, and let light in. And if people are bought into Jesus, they can see and understand that light. Does that make sense? So, so parables reveal things. If you're, if you're listening and you believe in Christ and you're listening to what Jesus is saying, they reveal things. But for people who haven't bought in to Jesus, they just muddy up the water. They kind of make things more confusing. And while they've, in one sense, heard Jesus say things, they don't get it at all because they don't believe in him. This is the function of parables. It's like when you watch a Disney movie as a kid, you just kind of watch the Disney movie, right? And when you're a kid, you only get so much. But then you watch that same Disney movie as an adult, and you all of a sudden are like picking up on all of the adult humor that they slipped in a Disney movie to make it bearable for parents. Well, this is kind of like the function of parables. If you're actually listening, you're going to catch things that the unlearned don't know. Parables reveal and they conceal. For those who want to hear, they'll hear it. For those who don't believe it, will miss it. And then Jesus begins explaining to the disciples what this parable means, what it's all about. And I think as we step into this, we'll begin to see the source of relevance for them. And I think we'll see it, that it's also relevant to us. Because here's the question. Why do some people get the message of Jesus and other people don't? Why do some people seem to get it and other people don't? Well, this parable asks that question. And I imagine if you're the disciples or if you're a follower of Jesus in that time, you're asking the same questions because they're like, man, what will it take? Like they're watching this guy literally heal people left and right. You got demons leaving people. And 
They just won't believe. Why don't more people get it? Why don't more people understand? Why are people resistant to the message? Well, Jesus will help, under, will help explain this. So first, he begins to talk on the seed on the path. He says quickly that the seed in the parable is the word of God. So Jesus explains that the seed along the path gets snatched up by birds. And so what this is kind of a metaphor for is that, that, that as the message of the gospel goes out, it will fall upon people and the, and the devil will just snatch away that seed from them. They won't ever come to believe. They're like hard soil that won't ever sink in and the devil comes and just snatches it away. And certainly we've grown up in church if you've grown up in church, you've seen this. I like you. You bring someone to church on Easter and they hear and see the message of the gospel on display and they just don't get it. It just doesn't click for them. Or they, you grow up in church with the same person and they never profess faith. And you do. Why? Well, the devil snatches it away. Paul would say in Corinthians that in their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The enemy has a real opposing role. He blinds the minds of unbelievers. And so as the gospel message goes out, it shouldn't be of a surprise to us that some people don't get it. Because if the soil's hard, the devil just snatches it away. But then Jesus goes on to talk about a different kind of circumstances, and that's the seed on the rocky ground. Jesus says, these people, when they hear the gospel, when they hear the good news, they're stoked about it. They receive it with joy. They're excited. They've found Jesus. And they have all sorts of joy in their lives. Their lives radiate for a season. But then the text says, that because they have no roots, when trials come, they wither up and they fall away. And man, that's a hard thing to hear. But I've seen this in my own life with people, where people, like, they come to faith and you're, they seem joyful about Jesus and, and all of a sudden, life gets hard. Or, or following Jesus is costly and then they slowly fade away. They wander from the faith. They maybe went back, they, maybe they got baptized on Easter. And then a year or two later, we have, they're nowhere to be found. And we ask what happened. And what happened is they had no roots. They had no roots. They were rocky soil. It happened back then in the time of Jesus. It's gonna happen now. But then Jesus moves on and he says, well, there's, there's another kind of soil and this is the seed that gets thrown among thorns. And the description is that these are the ones, and this is in verse 14, that when they heard that go on their way and are choked with worries, riches, and pleasures of life and produce no mature fruit. Jesus keeps using this parable to define and describe a real experience in life then and in life now. And if there's something we've seen over and over again, and we see over and over again in the New Testament, is that the love for the riches and pleasures of this world, a love for money, a love for comfort in the cares of life are spiritually threatening. So we see these people and these people claim to follow Jesus and then the love of the world, the love of stuff, the love of self, the love of ease, just slowly begins to be like thorns to their faith. They look to things of this world to satisfy them more than Jesus and slowly but surely, they fade away and their faith gets choked out. I think I've used this verse in a previous sermon at one point, but it bears repeating now, there's a man in the New Testament named Demas that was, a, that was a partner with Paul at one point. 
And then Paul describes him this way that in Timothy, that Demas has deserted me since he loved this present world and has gone to Thessalonica. Demas loved the world and he deserted Paul and deserted the mission. The reality is worries, riches, and pleasure and comfort are what can choke out growth and cause faith to wither. I think this is partly why the Barna Christian Research Group once noted that about 70% of all students that enter college with a faith will leave the faith on the other side of it. Worries, riches, cares, pleasures, wealth, thorns, choking out the life of Christ in someone. But then Jesus doesn't stop there. Lastly, he describes the good soil. And of the good soil, Jesus said, these are the ones who, having heard the word with an honest and good heart, hold on to it, and by enduring, produce fruit. Those in good soil, the seed, the gospel message that, that bears fruit, is the ones that fall on good soil. And how did, why do they bear fruit? Because they hear and hold and endure. That's all. They hear, hold, endure, and produce fruit. And so they persist. They prove to be good soil. And this is the experience of, of everyone in this room, really. We can probably all look to people and say, man, I've seen this in my own life. I've seen this with people I've been in church with. I've seen this with my neighbors. I've seen, I've seen this over and over and over again that as the gospel goes out, these are kind of the four different things that happen. People just reject it altogether. Some people shine for a little bit and fade away. Other people seem to get choked. Their faith gets choked out by, by life and then other people seem to endure and last. But then Jesus slightly pivots away from his story which brings us to our last point, a story lived. Did you notice in the passage, either when we were reading it or when we were describing it, there is a progression in the seed, in the soil. The first soil, the person, the seed like never goes into the soil at all. It's too hard. The second soil, the seed starts to produce something, but is choked out by life. And then the third soil, the seed seems to have life, but it produces no mature fruit. And in the last soil, it's, they have mature fruit. Because what Jesus is doing with this parable here in Luke is describing not just what happens out there, but describing what happens in here. He's describing what happens in our hearts. Because what we immediately do with this parable is start thinking through naturally, and it's not wrong, to, to start thinking through all the people that fit the various categories and maybe try to identify where we are. Oh, we're good soil because we're sitting here. But Jesus is doing something more with it than just describing a reality. He's driving this parable inward. So I think we should cast our assumption of, about what soil we are to the side for a moment and look at what Jesus says next in these seemingly two disconnected stories. In verse 16, he says, right after he explains this parable of the sower, no one after lighting a lamp covers it with a basket or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see its light for nothing is concealed that won't be revealed and nothing hidden that won't be made known and brought into light. Jesus is saying that light has come into the world. And his light is a revealing light. It ex it's an exposing light. It, it will reveal what has been kept hidden. It makes things plain. It penetrates darkness. Jesus is light. And Jesus shows by his light that, that he will expose what's really inside of people. You can't hide it. You can't 
hold it back from the light of Jesus. Jesus will make it plain. And then Jesus calls us to live in this light. Because after we've experienced the light of Christ, the light who in Luke 1 is described as the dawn shining over the darkness, after we've experienced this, we then, we can't keep living life in a hidden way. We can't hide that light within us. That light must display, be put on display for others to see. The light of Christ is a revealing light. And so Jesus says, take care how you listen. For whoever has, more will be given to him. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, will be taken away. Why does Jesus keep talking in such a confusing way? What does this mean? Well, kind of like we said earlier in our passage, those willing to hear the message of Jesus, well, they'll be led into more truth about who Jesus is. It's actually pretty simple. Jesus says that, that, and that whoever doesn't have this light, whatever that person thinks they have, will be taken away. So you, you either buy into Jesus and you, and you get who Jesus is and you live your life in light of that, or you don't buy into Jesus and you don't really get who Jesus is and, to, and get to live in light of who he is. Be careful how you listen, Jesus says. How's your hearing? Because he's encouraging us by way of this parable and by way of this following statement to live in response to who he is and evaluate what kind of soil we really are. And then abruptly the scene cuts. It's like if you, if you have your Bible open, it's this, it's this funny thing between verses 18 and verses 19. Jesus talks about all this stuff and then like scene cuts we move to this other event where all of a sudden there's a crowd again and his mother and his brothers are trying to like push through to get to Jesus and someone comes to Jesus and says, hey, your mother and your brothers are trying to get to you and it's so crowded that they can't and Jesus says, my mother and my brothers are those who hear and do the word of God. And with that final sentence, Jesus pulls together everything we just heard. My mother and my brothers are those who hear and do the word of God. Jesus is looking for people who are hearers and doers. His family, his people, his mother and brothers are the people that don't just listen to him, but like the good soil, Endure, persist, hear, lay hold of, grab by the ears as it were, and then live life in response to who he is. Who don't hide the light of Christ, but who let that light permeate the darkness of their souls and choose to walk in that light with Jesus. Because how we're supposed to respond to this text is not just to ask who is everyone in my life right now? What kind of soil are they? Or it's not just to look back on your past and say, oh, this person was, was they must have been on thorny grounds because they had a vibrant faith and it slowly faded away. It's not to do any of that. It's to ask, what soil am I most in danger of being like? And to hear Jesus say, listen up. Be good soil. What soil are you in danger of being right now? Are you a new Christian? Maybe you just came to faith in the last week, months, years. Brother or sister, can I tell you that the danger for you is that your faith is so new and the enemy is going to try to snatch it away. You have a heart that's 
only begun to just grow in Jesus. You're at risk of being the rocky soil and of giving up when it gets hard. There's a chance that when when your life in Christ begins to cost you something or when life gets difficult, that you will want to fall back from the faith. And the warning for you is, be good soil. Endure. Hear. Hold. Endure. Produce fruit. Hear. Hold. Endure. Produce fruit. That's the message of Jesus for you. That when you're tempted to give up, keep showing up. Keep going to church. Keep surrounding yourself with Christians. Keep reading your Bible. Keep hearing. Endure. Realize that there's a risk for you, Christian. Keep confessing sin. Keep on. Maybe you're sitting here and your life is just hard right now. I mean, you're at risk of being that rocky soil too. That, That slowly but surely, the roots of your life get pulled up. And instead of the trial driving you to Jesus, it drives you from Jesus because it usually only goes one of two ways. So can I encourage you to run to Jesus? Put, your, put the roots of your life in him. Beth Moore once said, only you can decide how your fires will affect you. Will you be sanctified or will you be scared? You're gonna inevitably hit trials. And so friends, will you be sanctified? Will you just hear and hold on to the words of Jesus and endure and produce fruit? How about, are you comfortable? I fear that for the majority of us, this is kind of where we lie. We're comfortable. We're like, we're in danger of being that third soil, the soil that the thorns slowly strangle out our faith. We have our retirement plans, our health care, our 401ks, our, our busy schedules to manage, our kids' activities, our worries, our care. And suddenly, all of these really good things that God gives us turn into the thing that take over our lives as Jesus slowly gets pushed out further and further. You start finding more joy and money, sex, love, the fleeting pleasures of this world, comfort and ease. And then slowly but surely like thorns, they can choke out your faith. And Jesus is calling us to evaluate. What soil are we in danger of being? And so I ask Maybe you're here and you just don't know where you are with Jesus at all. Well, you're like the first soil. That's the soil you're at risk. Because you can only have two responses to Jesus. You can either believe in him and submit your life to him and to his love and goodness to you, or you can just be hard soil that never really believes and that misses out on life with God. Where are you with Jesus? Because the only people that get to be close to Jesus, the only people that follow Jesus, that Jesus is willing to call brother and mother are the people who hear and do his will. Throughout the book of Luke so far, we've seen over and over again this emphasis that the kingdom of God has come. We've seen Jesus preach good news to the poor. We've seen Jesus heal people of their diseases. We've seen Jesus release those in bondage to sin. And that kingdom, this this kingdom of light and love and goodness and freedom is here in Jesus Christ. And he's calling us to live as citizens of the kingdom, to choose to be good soil. He's called to be people who hear and who do his will. People who see that Jesus brings in this kingdom of light, that the dawn has risen and is expelling the darkness. And then we're called to be people who rearrange our whole lives 
in light of this. Because right hearing leads to right living. If we hear Jesus, if we really hear his good message, he, we want to live in response to that life. So how are you hearing? What soil are you in danger of becoming? In my study this week, I came across this quote by a theologian, Craig Keener. He says, the only conversions that count in the kingdom are those confirmed by a life of discipleship. The only conversions that count in the kingdom are those confirmed by a life of discipleship. Jesus is calling us to follow after him. In the good news, friends, is he didn't leave us alone in the process. He's given us his people to help. And even more than that, he's given us his Holy Spirit to enable us to endure and hold on. And friends, the beautiful thing about the, this parable of the sower is that the people who do fruit are this, the people that endure. They just choose to keep on with Jesus and eventually their lives start producing fruit. So I just wanna encourage you to keep on with Jesus. Keep on with Jesus and watch your life produce fruit. Because the message of the gospel, that Christ took our sin upon himself, died and rose again so that we might have new life and live forever with him, is a life that not only changes our future, but changes our present. So hear what Jesus says, hold on to it, endure, and then watch your life produce fruit.